You know, if you read the Holy Bible very carefully, especially the books of the minor prophets, from the book of Daniel right up to the book of Malachi, they are called minor prophets not because they are of any lesser importance, but because the messages that they give are very short, just like me, short. <laughs> My other respected men of God are much taller. So, short messages, but if you read them, they will scare the daylights out of you. <laughs> because from the book of Jose, right up to the book of Malachi, you don't find any good messages there. You'll only find words of warning and words of admonition. But you'll also find promises spice here and there all throughout their books. Those promises of good blessings from God are in answer to repentance or to a nation turning around to the living God. So that was their task. And every prophet who ever appeared in the history of Israel, you'll always find them bringing words of warning, words of admonition to stir a nation back to righteousness so that it will be in right standing with God. You know, among all the prophets in the Bible, the one that most people like the most is Isaiah. Because the entire book of Isaiah is full of loving, kind words, full of words of encouragement, full of words of consolation. However, if you read them very carefully, especially the first 30 chapters or first 40 chapters, they too are full of warnings, full of admonition. So likewise, I bring you. <laughs> so by, by now you should know what I'm going to speak. You know, yesterday, at about 11.30 at night, as I was waiting on God, when I bowed my knees to pray, I saw the Lord Jesus appear in my room, and this was what he spoke. And I'm going to quote to you as exactly as how I receive it from the Lord. Tell them that I will visit them with an iron hand to judge and punish if the nation votes for same-sex marriage bill. Now I know that you are at a crossroad, right? In fact, you are in a balance. You can for righteousness or you can tip for unrighteousness. You can tip either way, you can swing either way. That's where you are right now, at a crossroads. And I have read something about that, what the plebiscit that you are going to go for, but I've never paid much attention or delved deeply into what exactly is the issues in this nation? But this is what the Lord said. Tell them, I will visit them with an iron hand to judge and punish if the nation votes for same-sex marriage bill. So which means, it's not just the voting, it's the result of the vote. 
if a large majority has voted for saying yes, then it becomes a law, right? Your parliament will pass a bill saying now same-sex marriage act is approved. And not only the secular justices or marriage registrars are anxiously waiting to conduct same-sex marriage. There are some churches who are also very anxiously waiting to be the first person to conduct or marry a same-sex partner. See, that is a worse, disgusting act that can be conducted or done in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, when a minister conducts a wedding, the couple stands before him, he stands by the pulpit, and in the name of the triune God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, he's going to pronounce them man and wife. That's what they usually do, right? Now, instead of a man and a wife, there's going to be a man and a man, and a woman and a woman. So he's going to stand here and say, in the name of the triune God, I now bless you, men and men. Or woman and woman. That's what he's going to do. And in the name of the Lord. So you are going to take the name of the Lord in vain. And you are going to pronounce a benediction. The blessings or the word of blessings that will come out of the lips of a minister. It will be words of blessings. If you read Numbers chapter 6. Verses 22 to 24. The Lord God through the prophet Moses gave a command to Aaron how he should bless the children of Israel. And the command was, as soon as Aaron speaks those words, those blessings will come upon the children of Israel. So that is the vested authority on the priest because of the anointing that is upon his life when he speaks a word of blessings the word of blessings comes out of his mouth as the Lord will bless a couple so here you have a gay hearted priest see a, a minister may not be a gay externally but if you approve such a thing, you are a gay in your heart. You are not a gay externally. You may, you may be a good husband with a good wife, but for you to say yes, for you to say it's okay, this is okay, this is just an alternate lifestyle. If you say that, your heart is a gay heart. Your mind is a gay mind. So as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So as you think in your heart, then you become a gay. You may not be physically, but in the eyes of God when he looks at you, he sees you as a gay person. Amen. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ was so explicit to say, if a man looks at a woman and lusts after her in his heart, it's not just looking. Because when you walk past by, you are always looking. Even when I stand here, I'm looking. Looking is not the problem. Is what happens after the looking. What is the result of the looking? When you lust in your heart, you are an adulterer. 
you may not have done it in the flesh. You don't need to commit adultery in the flesh. You have already committed adultery in your heart. In the same manner, when you lift up your hand to say yes and amen, to vote for same-sex marriage or gay rights, then you have become a gay in your heart and your mind. Now, why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Among the many nations that have existed in the face of this world, the most famous nations for gays, we, as we all know, is Sodom and Gomorrah. Another word for homosexual people is a sodomite. Or the, the act of homosexuality is also called sodomy. Now where do we get all those words from? Right from the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? If you read Genesis chapter 18 verse 20, the Lord God said, and the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, the cries that came from the land was very great and grievous in the years of the Lord. Now that's what God said. Now when the two angels that were sent to spy out Sodom and Gomorrah, when they came into the land, now this is what they said. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. The land has been crying out to God because of the grief, grief and great sins in the land. Now, besides a, a gay man having relationship with another gay man or a lesbian woman having relationship with another lesbian woman, what is so great or so grievous about Sodom and Gomorrah is that innocent people were brutally raped. See, if you look into Genesis chapter 19 very carefully, you will find that not every single person in Sodom and Gomorrah were a gay. There were some straight people. There were some innocent people. A good example is the family of Lot. We know that Lot was a honest, God-fearing man. So was his wife. Not only that, he had two virgin daughters. So they were unspotted. They kept themselves clean from all the sexual defilement in the land. So just like them, there were many, many innocent people in Sodom and Gomorrah who were brutally molested, brutally raped, and brutally taken advantage of. Now this was a revelation from the Lord, but when I was looking to the scriptures in different translations of the Bible, I was very surprised to find that it is also written in the scriptures like that. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 and 21, in the, the message translation of the Bible, it says like this, God continued, the cries of the victims in Sodom and Gomorrah are deafening. The sin of those cities is immense. I am going down to see for myself. See if what they are doing is as bad as it sounds, then I'll know. Now look at the first sentence, it says, the cries of the victims. If they are all consenting partners, they will not be victims. 
Everybody agrees? To be a victim, you are not a consenting partner. So your rights are violated. Your physical body is violated. So they were not only committing fornication among themselves, they were also brutally abusing the innocent. They were brutally raping, molesting, even killing. You know, today, it is very common to read that when a young girl is raped, many a times she's also killed. Do you have that problem in your country? We have that in India. I used to wonder why do these rapists kill these young girls? No, they have already raped this girl. At least they could have just leave them alone. And as I pondered, this is the thought that came to my mind. I may be right, I may be wrong. This is not a revelation. This is just my assumption. Could it be that these girls or these innocent ones are killed so that they will not report or testify against their rapists? A rapist wants to escape the law. So to kill their victim is to silence the evidence. And now look at the attitudes of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis chapter 13 verse 13 says, But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. So not only were they wicked, they were also sinful. Now I would like you to also take note of all these, all these pointers that I'm sharing with you and to check it against the society in Australia. You want to check and see if there is a parallelism between what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah to what is happening in Australia. You want to check them. If they all tellies, or a majority of them tellies, then you will know what is your fate as it came upon Sodom and Gomorrah. So they were very, very filthy and wicked. What does that mean? They were, men was fornicating against men. Now that we know it's called in our language today, homosexuality. Not only that, do you, want, do you want me to be very candid and real? Or do you want me to just hide something so, so as to appear politically correct? <laughs> do you want me to lay it as it is? Yes. All right. Now I'm going to share with you very candidly what God showed me last night about the situation in Sodom and Gomorrah. Why they were so wicked and evil in the sight of God, so much so that he had to destroy that entire people group. They were fornicating, man with man and woman with woman, and the gross sin, you know, I'm, I'm very, very hesitant to share with you because it is really, really gross. I not only heard this from the Lord, but in a vision I saw last night, this acts that the people in Sodom and Gomorrah did. It is too gross to even say it in public. They were eating and drinking the male semen and offered them as a drink offering to demons. You know, this is something which is very, very true even in modern world today, that the male seed and the female seed are important ingredients in demon worship. They are offered as a sacrifice 
to get powers from the demons and many many got men of various other religions they became got men with various powers because of this act that they do most of them you'll find are always single see it is forbidden for them to have a normal family life and then they offer their male seat as an offering unto these gods see there is life in the male seat and there's life in the female seat so you're taking that life and you're offering it it is like offering a baby as a sacrifice the only difference in this case is that which comes out of the male body or female body without mixing together with a male ovule a male sperm and a female ovule it remains pure on its own so that which is offered as a sacrifice to these demons are an un diluted unadulterated sacrifice so it's a pure sacrifice of high power and that results in the god men being endowed with powers from the evil one you know when my when my father was a hindu priest i remember I was very small at that time. I used, I used to remember seeing him that when he came back home after his work, he had a normal job as a mailman and all his spare time, he devoted himself as a priest. He prayed very ardently every day for several hours every night from about seven in the evening right up to about 12 or 1 or 2 in the morning i see him stand before this box of our altar and before the idols and he'll just chant the prayers over and over again for hours then after about 40 days he received what i would call today the baptism of the evil spirits just like we receive the baptism of the holy spirit he received the baptism of the evil spirits and the spirits came upon him and endowed him with the gift of prophecy with the gift of healings and the gift of working miracles and i was an eyewitness to all this you know when demon possessed people those hindus those muslims and the buddhists they come he will just lay his hands and cast those demons out and when they are sick they come to him he lays his hands under the inspiration of those evil spirits and they are healed and when they come with a problem to seek an answer from god like seeking after medium he'll go into this trance and then speaks in strange language like how we would speaks in unknown tongues and then he gives them a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge i have seen this with all my eyes let me give you one very good example when i was 12 years old I prayed to the gods in our home. I prayed that if I pass in my exams, I would fulfill a vow. I made a vow to the gods. Now, when I made a vow, no one in our house knew about it. I never told anybody my vow. It was just between me and my god. And after I passed my exams with flying colors, like all of us do today, we make our vows to our, the living god after the after god blesses us most of us always do one thing we forget to keep our vows amen everybody <laughs> see you all are wonderful honest christians <laughs> so i forgot my vow a few months later one day while there was a ceremony in our house the spirits came upon my father and he was ministering to so many people and i was his assistant priest <laughs> see you have assistant pastor 
there is also an assistant priest. Every priest has an assistant. They don't do all the job by themselves. So I was his assistant and suddenly, you see now he's under the full anointing of the evil spirits. He just turned to me and pointed a finger at me and revealed the vow that I made. Now that is, that is what we would call a gift of the word of knowledge. He revealed the vow and threatened me with dire consequences if I don't keep the vow. So what would you do naturally? Out of fear, you want to keep the vow. Why Christians don't keep their vows? Because the living good God doesn't threaten you with dire consequences. <laughs> Isn't it? So, now, the point is this. When my father was being endowed with this powers and gifts from the evil one, they demanded a sacrifice from him in return for the powers that were given to him. So on the day that he was baptized, every year he was required to offer <coughs> blood sacrifice. So I remember the very first time that he went to offer the blood sacrifice. At 12 midnight, he went to a cemetery. And this is what he said. He took, he folded up his sleeves, took a long knife and cut his hand from the wrist up to the elbow. A, a big cut and blood came out of his hand and he said to his great shock, not a single drop of blood fell to the ground. They would come out of his hand and then they all disappear in mid-air. I'm sure I've heard of blood-sucking demons. He saw with his own eyes which proved them to be very real. So they drink blood, not only blood, but also this male seed and female seed. Now these same acts were also done by the false prophets under Jezebel. If you read 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 31 to 33, and chapter 18, verse 19, there were 850 false prophets under Jezebel. And among the 850, 450 of them were prophets of Baal. Now it is Baal who demands such kinds of sacrifices. Baal demands human sacrifice and Baal demands these kinds of sexual, unclean sexual acts as sacrifices. So there were temple prostitutes and there were gay priests. So these were all acts were done during the time of Sodom and Gomorrah and also done by the priests under Jezebel. And when you read 1 Kings chapter 18, after the showdown that the prophet Elijah had with the false prophets, among the 850 of them, he only killed 450 prophets of Baal. He did not kill the other, uh, sorry, 450. He did not kill the other 400 false prophets. Why? Only Elijah knows the answer. But he only killed 450 prophets of Baal because I guess they were the worse than the others. Because they are the ones who promoted lewd, unclean, demonic practices all over the land of Israel. Now as, as the Lord gave me this message, I remembered about a vision that I saw last year about this time during the conference. So I checked my notes and I looked at this vision that I saw 
in this vision i saw a scene that was taking place in heaven you know you read in daniel chapter 7 that the books were opened and the court in heaven was set and then in revelation chapter 20 you will read the books were opened and the court was set and in jeremiah chapter 23 verse 18 you will read that a council in heaven was set and the deliberations were made concerning affairs of the nations and in amos chapter 3 verse 7 you will read that in the council the prophets are gathered there and god reveals his secrets to the prophets and before he does anything he first shares with his prophets what he's going to do in the same manner i saw in this vision the council in heaven and they were discussing about the situation in Australia, or very particularly Sydney. So among the many representations that were made, I saw two angels who were called to testify in the council. And this is what they said. Those two angels, when I saw them, they were identified as the very two angels that were sent to spy Sodom and Gomorrah. So they stood there and this is what they said. When we visited Sodom and Gomorrah, only men were engaged in gross sexual acts. But here, meaning this nation, it is woman with woman, mankind with animals, parents with children, and some grandparents with their grandchildren. These parents engage in sexual perversions with their children as if they were husbands and wives. See, that's the report that's been submitted in heaven. That's their findings. When they went out all over the city, all over the nation, and they saw what was being done the things that were done publicly and the things that were done in the secret. See, don't ever think just because you are within close doors, close environments, no one sees you. A human being may not see you. A human eye may not see what your left hand is doing and your right hand is doing. Human eye will not see. But the eyes of God Amen. that goes out all over the world, it sees everything. Two years ago, I was leaving Los Angeles airport to go to Houston. And a mighty angel came and stood beside me when we were standing in the airport. And the angel identified himself as the angel of United States, and he had a huge sledgehammer in his hand. He was so gigantic in size, and he said, we are going to strike this city with an earthquake. Strike means strike this region, in the Californian region, with an earthquake. And when he spoke that, I saw hundreds of angels lining up in a line all over the Californian region with, all, with sludge hammers ready at a given notice to bang on the ground. And when they did, there will be a massive earthquake all along California. Six months later, Hollywood released a movie called San Andreas the very place that I saw the angels were going to strike for a massive earthquake. And then he also told me that three other places have been predetermined, pre-selected for earthquakes to rock the nation. Three places. And I don't know which are the three places. The only one place I know was California. And this will be massive earthquakes that will break the nation apart to pieces. 
mean the whole continent of US will cease to exist. It will break apart in three pieces. And the Atlantic Sea, ocean, will all flow into heaven. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. <coughs> Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, and chapter 22, verse 15 tells us, gays, lesbians, trans transgenders will not be allowed into the kingdom of heaven. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled, the scripture says. Don't be fooled. Such will not be allowed in. Amen. When a nation approves such a law, it is giving itself over to the worship of demons as it was done during the days of Noah. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, you will read that during the days of Noah, the reason why God had to destroy the first race is because there was so much of demon worship and also intermingling between human flesh and the spirit beings. Two gross things that happen. And in Psalms 106 verse 37 tells us, much human sacrifice were given to those demons during that period. Now when a nation approves such a law, what will be the result? It will open the floodgate to bestiality, which will give breed to evil spirits having sexual relations with humans, which again were done during the days of Noah. Now this kind of sexual perversion will give breed to strange flesh. Now take note of the word strange flesh. You'll read in the book of Numbers that when the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, when they offered fire, incense before God, the Bible says God looked down from heaven and he saw it not as fire for incense, he saw it as a strange fire. And immediately fire came down from heaven and killed, consumed the two sons of Aaron instantly. They became ashes. Strange fire that is not of the right kind. So now you have strange flesh that is not of the ordinary kind. Now what is this strange flesh? The strange flesh is the crossbreed between a human and a spirit being, which was practiced during the times of Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2 and verse 4. Now there is a strange prophecy in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 43, which says that something like this will once more take place in the last days. It says like this, in part, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another. They will mingle with the seed of men. Once again, this will happen in the last days. You know, you may have heard of many, I don't know whether you have heard it in Australia, but I've heard it in India, I've heard it in Africa, where people claim to have sex with spirits. Have you heard anything like this in your country? You have. So this is a common thing. Now what is a one-off thing here and there will become a common thing. That is why this same-sex marriage, a thing that was unheard of or a thing that was kept hidden in the closet for ages of time 
has now come out in the open. In Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 9, the prophet Moses warned the whole of Israel about Miriam's fate. What did he warn her about? Everyone knows. So he just reminded them and he warned them about Miriam. What did Miriam do? Numbers chapter 12 verses 1 to 2 tells us she spoke against God's anointed servant. Even though they are siblings, but the office in which Moses stood was totally different from the office that Miriam or Aaron stood. See, what was just a family squabble became a spiritual problem. A family squabble must be a family squabble. An interpersonal squabble must be an interpersonal squabble. It should not become a spiritual squabble. If it becomes spiritual, then you are touching God's anointed. See, Miriam, Moses, Aaron, brothers and sisters. Miriam, uh, Moses married a second wife without consulting his older sister. See, in the Eastern culture, you don't do things on your own without consulting your elders in the family. You go and tell the elders, this is what I like to do. And then uh, they said, okay, go. Go ahead and do it. Even though you know they will approve, but it is proper courtesy and proper respect to let your elders know. So in this case, Moses failed to follow protocol. So Miriam, being the oldest in the family, was very, very upset. How can the baby brother go and get a wife? And on top of that, a stranger woman. She's not an Israelite. A stranger woman. She was so upset. They were just quarreling. Suddenly, the inevitable happened. She stepped over and she said, Who does Moses think he is? Does he think he's a great prophet? We are also prophets. God speaks to us. Does he think God only speaks to him? Now, if you read chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 very carefully, till it was a family squabble, God did not interfere. Because it's a family squabble. They fight today, they hug and kiss tomorrow. That's what families do, right? There are no permanent enemies in a family. But the moment she began to criticize and backbite Moses' anointing, then God stepped into the picture and he said, How dare you speak against my servant? Till then the Lord never interfered. See, a family squabble should be a family squabble. A husband-wife fights and quarrels, let it be a husband-wife problem. Don't ever say, who do you think you are? You think you are a great pastor? Uh -huh. A family squabble should be a family squabble. An interpersonal squabble should be an interpersonal squabble. Never, never step the toes of the anointing. This was the warning that Moses gave to us. He said, this was the warning. And as a result of that, she was cursed by God and she became a leper. From head to toe, instantly, she became a leper. And Moses fell at the feet of the Lord and he cried and he repented and he pleaded before God on her behalf. And God was entreated by the intercession of Moses and he just told him, told him, Okay, let her be unclean for seven days. See, what is supposed to be a permanent thing only lasted for seven days. So God forgave and healed her. However, the sin remained. Because of the sin, she was not allowed to enter into Canaan land. Not allowed. God forgave. But you became disqualified. 
He forgave you. He restored you. Your salvation is intact. But you are disqualified. You know, you may have read of the many ministers and women of God who were mightily used by God and then who fell. But they have been restored by God, but you no more see them in the same glory like how they had walked in the past. Am I right, everybody? Because they were disqualified. Forgiven, but disqualified. The glory removed from them. Forgiven. Their salvation is secured, but disqualified. A very good scriptural example I give you. The life of Samson. Was he forgiven? Yes. But disqualified. Because he died. Right? He could have left longer. But he died prematurely. Because of his sin. Was that God's perfect will for him? No. no. He should have lived long. And then just slept in the Lord. But because of his sin. Because he disregarded the anointing. And he took the anointing of God very lightly. That was what angered God more. He took God for granted. You know, listen everybody. This is a warning for these last days. God can be friendly, but not familiar. He can be very friendly. He can come down to your level more than you think he can be a friend. But there is still a fine line that he is God and you are just a worm. So we should never forget that. He is still God on the throne. No matter how friendly he is. You know, let me very candidly share with you my walk with God. This is not to boast, but to just give you an example about this statement that I just made. Sometimes, when I go back, it's my custom that each time I go back after a meeting, I will kneel down and give thanks to God for what God did in the meeting. And lately, I, have, I, seen some, I see something new. That each time I go into my room, before I could kneel down, I see the Lord seated in the sofa and he looked at me with welcoming look on his face and said, how did the meeting go today? You know, the, the very first time I had this experience, I was taken aback for a moment by that uh, gesture of the Lord. It was so very downwardly, so very common, so very humanly, you know. So for a moment, I, I, I didn't know what to answer the Lord. I said, Lord, you should know. You were there. <laughs> <laughs> but even though he was there, he still likes that family talk. That friendly talk. How did it go? How did the meeting go? So then I told the Lord, Lord, this is what happened. See, recently I was in Northeast India a very remote part of India called Harunachal Pradesh. So, on the last day of the meeting, I was praying for the people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I have certain procedure how to do the meeting. So, 300 people were going to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And uh, before I could organize them properly, the pastor made a mess of what I would do properly. So, now, those who have received the Holy Spirit and those who have not received the Holy Spirit are all grouped together. They all seated in one group and it was difficult for me to separate them. So I thought, how am I going to now pray? Because I was going to go down among them, lay my hands to pray for them. Now they are all grouped together. I do not know who is filled and who is not filled. So anyway, I thought, all right, let's just trust God to do something new. So I was leading the people to confess their sins and make their lives right and the people and a wave of conviction came upon them and they were all crying they were repenting they were praying 
while they were crying and repenting and praying at the back of that auditorium or that tent i saw a wave of sea of waters coming forth and come and flash on the whole crowd and when it did they were all filling the holy spirit everyone who needs to be filling the holy spirit was filling the holy spirit while i was still talking and leading them through the formula so when i came back to my room the lord asked me how did the meeting go so i told him with great excitement what happened and he looked at me and said do you know this is exactly what happened on that day when peter was preaching at cornelius house while he was preaching the holy spirit fell on them all he said this is exactly what happened that day now this is the way you know the lord can be very friendly but he cannot be familiar the moment you cross the line then god shows himself to be god so miriam crossed the line and she was disqualified and numbers chapter 16 verses 1 to 3 says she was gathered and she was buried and numbers chapter 20 verse 1 says because of a sin she died in the wilderness now this is something the lord showed me about her life if not for her sin if she had not sin and died in the wilderness she would have been honored as mother of faith in the whole of israel and you know who later on received that title debora she became known as the mother of israel which would have gone to miriam and not only that she would have established she would have been known as a mother of faith and worship and she would have established schools of worship for young girls to sing and dance like angels because she was taught by the angels to sing and to dance so that was the highest call for miriam but she fell